Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc, and today we're going to talk about a very controversial topic, artificial sweetness. And one of the uh, questions that a patient of mine recently asked me, uh, we were chatting away, and uh, she said, is stevia not exactly like vaping? And that was a very, very interesting question. So I'm going to break down in the context of my practice, in the context of my own life, how that all works. And with, there's a whole variety of artificial sweetness, from monk fruit to stevia to erythritol, uh, 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 some of the phenyl-containing products, a, a whole variety of them. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is they all cause harm. So don't quote at me, um, oh, this study said this causes this harm, this study says this causes harm, because the amount of harm that the artificial sweeteners actually cause is no different than the harm that you that is caused by the air that you breathe if you live in a city. So if you're going to live inside a coal mine, if you're going to live in Times Square, New York City, four o'clock on a Friday afternoon versus living in the Rocky Mountains, uh, there's obviously a juxtaposition. But we get environmental toxins in everything we do. And if you choose to li live in a big city, if you choose to live in Tokyo or Paris or London or Hong Kong or Beijing or Delhi, look at the air quality. So don't come at me with, oh, this thing causes and this thing causes. There really is no absolute proof that artificial sweeteners cause harm. There's no absolute proof that artificial sweeteners cause harm in humans. The best you can do is show me some studies from animals where they're basically consume their body weight in, in artificial sweeteners, a very contrived environment, or alternatively, certain studies that are associations, epidemiologic studies. And I'm, as you've heard me talk about, going to discount that. And part of the reason I say that is, yes, it's ideal to breathe the air in the Rocky Mountains. And you can choose to move there if you do. But at the same time, if you're going to live in New York City or you're going to live in a big industrial area, do the best you can to protect yourself, but accept the fact that the air quality is not going to be perfect. Same thing with the artificial sweetness. So I work in the carbohydrate addiction arena, and nobody is going to criticize a heroin or an opioid addiction program from using Symboxin or using methadone to help addicts in a transition to recover. The, nobody's going to criticize, or some people will, in fact, I, I to a certain extent do, but using vaping or electronic cigarettes as a step away from smoking. The only issue is the narrative is being pushed by tobacco companies because they want people to vape increasingly. It's cheaper, the profit margins are higher than cigarettes and they don't have to pay tobacco farmers. So, if you're going to go from smoking to vaping, the goal there is to have an exit strategy where you are no longer using nicotine products. Hi, folks. <clears throat> this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I was walking my dog this morning, like I do every morning, and reviewing the video before James posted it. And there is a very important fact that I want to hammer home. So I'm going to play, do it more succinctly, and it's this. The greatest cause of cancer, universally, obviously there are asbestos and other things, but the greatest universal threat to you getting cancer is insulin resistance. And anything you can do to become insulin sensitive, to get rid of car excess carbohydrates, is going to benefit you from a cancer reduction perspective. In that regard, if you can use artificial sweeteners instead of sugar, as a replacement for sugar in your diet, in your journey toward insulin sensitivity, you are actually radically reducing your risk of cancer, especially if you're obesogenic. And therefore, the use of artificial sweeteners as a segue toward insulin sensitivity is far more important in cancer reduction 
than any potential or theoretical threat that artificial sweeteners can have to cause cancer. Now, of course, if you can get to be sugar-free without artificial sweeteners, that's the best you can do. However, if you need artificial sweeteners from time to time to prevent you from using sugar, of course, that's the right thing to do. And the goal is always that this is a transition point. And that's how I view the artificial sweeteners. The artificial sweeteners have two roles in my practice. Number one, if you're going, if you drink a case of Coke a day and you want to move to Crystal Light or you want to add Relight, which contains some, some of the Relight salt mixes, contain some artificial sweetener. Or you want to do um, a Gatorade Zero instead of regular Gatorade. I have no problem with that. I really have no problem because we really want you to escape from the heavy carbohydrates that you're using as a snack, as a drink that are causing harm, obesity, diabetes, metabolic disease. The artificial sweeteners do not contribute to those diseases. Now, we've got two different types of people. We've got those that consume an artificial sweetener that are triggered to go back to carbohydrates because they, they revoke that sweetness in their brains. If that's who you are, logic dictates that you stay away from all kinds of sweet foods. If, however, you're a little bit like me, where the artificial sweetener from time to time is necessary, or nothing's necessary, is of huge value to avoid hitting something that contains glucose, galactose, or fructose, carbohydrates, at a time of emotional distress, I have no issue with that. I have no issue with that. So from time to time, I will use a Fresca, use a Gatorade Zero as a bridge item to get me across that emotional tension as a mind-cleansing moment to avoid me from reaching for the M&Ms and the Coke. I am a carbohydrate addict. I've lost 106 pounds. I've changed those relationships. I typically, as you guys know, drink tea and coffee. Because an emotional event is always a nutritional event. Sorry. <laughs> a snack is always an emotional event. See, I got my head confused there. Um, however, from time to time, I do enjoy a sugar-sweetened, uh, at least an artificial sweet, sugar-sweetened beverage to bridge me across. And I have no issue with that as long as it's not a trigger for more and it's done occasionally. So if you want to Diet Coke from time to time, if you want to drink some Crystal Light, if you want to drink your Relight with flavoring in it, I don't have a problem. If you don't like it, don't do it, but don't blame it for health issues. Now, on the flip side, and this is where some of the confusion comes in, what I do not want you to do is to use artificial sweeteners to make lookalikes to eat. So a lot of people in the keto space where, they, where they're changing what they're eating, they're changing sugar, they're getting rid of sugar, but they're not understanding the why, the what they're eating. They're making keto ice cream. They're making keto brownies. They're making keto flours. They're making a bunch of keto products from art, using artificial sweeteners and some flour alternative. And that is problematic for me because what you're doing is you're recreating something you love to eat to give you that mind cleansing moment in a way that doesn't cause harm. Now you may say, well, this, the, the, the artificial sweetened, artificial sugar sweetened beverage does the same thing. Yes, it does. But that's on the hydration side. You're still consuming calories. There's no calories in those sugar sweetened beverages. That Gatorade Zero, that Fresca has no calories in it. However, anytime you eat something with artificial sweeteners, it automatically has calories to it, and you're eating those calories for your head, which to my mind equates to a snack. There's no difference between a keto brownie and a piece of cheese that you're eating as a snack. And that's problematic for me. Those lookalikes are an issue. Now, that's my perspective. Some people say, oh, yeah, yeah, lookalikes prevent me from... That's fine. Let's see where you are 5, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Because... Consuming lookalikes, in my experience with my patients, as well as my own life, is a segue to the real thing. It's like smoking a light cigarette or drinking a light beer. It revokes the addiction. 
And you could argue with me that the sugar sweetened beverage or the artificial sweetened beverage does the same thing. And I would argue with you, yes, it does for some people. For other people, it's protective. And again, leave comments on this. Play around with it. But I would tell you that the, the artificial sweeteners are useful as a segue away from carbohydrates through this, just like uh, um, vaping might be. But there has to be an endpoint. There has to be an endpoint. There are a lot of smokers who use gum instead of cigarettes for a while, but they don't maintain using gum all the time. They're not chowing down on 20 pieces of gum a day. Some are, and that's fine. But the majority of people use the gum for a while and then move on. And that's kind of what we're looking for, is we're looking for those artificial sweeteners to be a segue and eventually to use them less and less and less. But you want to create something that you can drink on a regular basis. And for some people, it's just the nature of, of who we are as humans in the modern era. Water is not necessarily adequate and the risk is too great of doing something harmful. As we've said before, humans are the only species that use anything other than water for hydration. But don't do the smoothies, don't do the protein shakes, don't do those calorie-laden beverages. I'd rather use an artificial sweetener. But ideally, tea, coffee, and water is ideal. But a lot of people do extremely well with artificial sweeteners in their drinks, but not in their food. So that's my position. And we'll discuss that as an individual. I think that's one of the key things is we are not algorithms. So for some people that works, for others it doesn't. All I'm saying is that within those boundaries, you can select where you are. Either perspective is absolutely fine. Sugar sweetened beverage is absolutely not. Using carbohydrates in our food, absolutely not for the carb addict. But consider yourself the individual. And if it works for you, continue to do it. If it doesn't work for you, if it triggers a relapse, then logic dictates stay away from it. I am the carb addiction doc. I will help you as an individual to define this. We'll look at your blood work. We will consult with you and figure out what makes you tick and help you to tick better. If you hate my content, if you like my content, leave a comment, like the show, and subscribe to it. Because my job is to make you think and to make you think objectively about the physiology and the pathophysiology, not the epidemiology, not the knee jerk, not that everybody says.